Great, we're going to read Acts chapter 1. Uh, it'll be on the screen, I think, but if you want to grab a Bible and turn to it, I'll give you a second now to do that. Right, let's read Acts chapter 1 together. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Right, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, let me add my welcome. It is uh, great to be able to gather uh, in this way, although as Nathan said, it's very strange for us to be here uh, in the chapel on our own, but hopefully you'll be able to hear everything uh, that is said and uh, follow and uh, hopefully uh, we'll really enjoy some prayer time uh, through the course of the evening. But we're going to start uh, by looking at this uh, chapter in the book of Acts. We're beginning a series uh, in the book of Acts that's going to take us right up to the wit half term and uh, the title we've given the series is Mission Possible. And you'll see from the outline, if you, you're able to, uh, that there are two reasons this title is significant for us. First, because all organizations and movements have the potential to lose sight of their mission or purpose, and churches are no exception. No matter how clear the mission at the beginning, over time, the movement or organization becomes tired, it becomes institutionalized, it becomes comfortable or tradition bound, or simply decides to go in a new direction. Did you know, for example, that Nokia, the giant mobile phone company, originally made tires? Or did you know that Lamborghini originally made tractors? Now those are perhaps positive or even glamorous examples of missions kind of changing direction over time. But when it comes to Christian churches, such evolution from the original mission is never a good thing. And that is, of course, because the mission, our mission, has been given to us by God. And yet history shows that so many churches do, in fact, lose sight of their mission over time. Many churches, many Christian organizations lose the original purpose and end up doing something completely different something that they were never meant to do. And I think that the book of Acts has been written precisely to get churches back on mission and to keep us there. It does this by revealing God's purposes for his world and then placing into that world the purpose of the local church. That's what I think the book of Acts is doing. It shows us God's purpose for his world and then shows us specifically the place of the ordinary local church in that world. And therefore, the book of Acts is tailor-made for any church that is in danger of losing its sense of mission, for any church that is in danger of falling asleep, 
for any Christians who find serving Christ an inconvenience or have no heart for mission, anyone who's in danger of forgetting its purpose or simply, and this might be closer to home, any church that is tired, coming out of a coronavirus lockdown, lacking in confidence or is facing uh, major challenges. Which brings us to the second reason the title Mission Possible is significant. See, one of the problems for us as readers of Acts is that we sometimes read the book of Acts and we compare it with our own experience and we wonder why the two are so different. We do not see the miracles and the extraordinary events that we read about in these chapters. We don't see people being baptized in numbers of 3,000 in one day. We don't see cripples being healed by a word or diseases being cured by touching a hanky. We see diseases spread by touching a hanky, but not cured. Now, this sense of disconnection between our experience and that of the first Christians can lead to two unhelpful responses. The first response is a general pessimism or paralysis about the mission. We feel that we have been sold some kind of lemon in terms of our time in history and we cannot possibly succeed we cannot possibly see the success that we read about in the book of acts and so we sink into pessimism and paralysis we sit we put our heads in the sand and perhaps we pray for revival the second response is kind of the opposite of that and that is a kind of optimism which says actually we can experience these things we can experience such growth, but the key is that we have to copy what the first Christians do in Acts. Now, I've been reading books about church for an, a long time, and every 10 years or so, I've noticed another book will come out that basically says, guys, you've got it all wrong. This is how you should do church. This is the model of how things should be. And very often these books, which often come across the Atlantic, not always, these books look at the book of Acts as a kind of mission manual for church growth. So for example, next week on Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. And there we're going to see this wonderful picture, a dynamic picture of an effective, united, powerful church spreading the gospel, performing miracles, being generous, seeing wonderful things happen. It's brilliant. And what these books and these church growth teachers do is they say, look at that. Why isn't your church like that? You guys must be doing something wrong. And so the answers come thick and fast one decade after another. Someone will say, you've got to be smaller, more intimate. It's house church. That's the key. And then 10 years later, someone says, no, no, no. You've got to be bigger, more efficient. Someone says, no, the key is small groups. Then someone else says, no, the key is leadership training. Someone says, you've got to get rid of all your rosters and just be more spontaneous. And that's how they did it in the early church. And someone else says, no, you've got to be better at evangelism. You've got to connect with people on the street. And then, of course, someone else comes along and says, now, the real problem is you are not full of the spirit in the same way they were. But I want to suggest that both the pessimism which says we can never experience the kind of growth that they experience. We've been sold a lemon in our time of history. And the optimism that says we can do it if only we follow those steps. I want to suggest that both of these are false ways of reading the book of Acts. What we're going to see, in fact, is that the mission God has given us is the same mission. And it's not an impossible one. While the experience is might not be quite the same for us because of time and history and culture and all sorts of other factors. The fundamentals of the mission are the same. It is mission possible. The caveat is that we do need to make sure that it's the mission that we are doing. It's not the technique that matters. And we're going to see this clearly next week in chapter two. It's the mission that matters. And every local church who remembers its mission and keeps on coming back to it will find itself caught up in the great work of God. We will see growth because growth is what God is about. And we will see that miracle of conversion. It is mission possible. We should be 
optimist when it comes to the mission of God. Well, that's a little introduction, but what is the mission? Well, this is what we're going to see in our first passage. Our mission, as you'll see on the outline, is Jesus' mission to establish his worldwide kingdom through his spirit-filled witnesses. That is our mission. Our mission is Jesus' mission to establish his worldwide kingdom through his spirit-filled witnesses. Jesus' mission, first of all, and it's important to notice in verse 1, that word began. You'll know very well that the book of Acts is a sequel to the book of Luke. What is the big difference between the two? Well, the contrast between the book of Luke and the book of Acts is not Jesus and then the church, or even Jesus and then the spirit, both books are about Jesus' ministry. The contrast is just that one tells the first stage and one tells the next stage. One in which he is physically present and one in which he is present by his spirit. But both books are telling the same story. That is crucial for us to understand what is going on. The book of Acts is telling us what Jesus is doing in his world. We must not imagine that when he ascended in verse 11, he was going to take up some hobby, going to some kind of retirement. He is just as active, if not more active, in the second book than in the first. Because in the second book, he is active by his spirit, which he sends on all his people. And this, of course, is why it's crucial never to separate the spirit and Jesus in our theology. Where the spirit is at work, Jesus is at work. They are working flat out to the same agenda. Well, what is that agenda? Well, secondly, Jesus' mission is to establish his worldwide kingdom. Have a look again at verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You may remember a few weeks ago when we looked at Luke 24, we saw that the whole of Luke 24 is set across one single day. Well, now we're told that Jesus actually appeared and taught his disciples for 40 days. You may remember in Luke 24, there was a, a lot of discipleship happening, a lot of learning. So the disciples' hearts were burning as Jesus explained the scriptures to them. But now we see that process went on for 40 days. It must have been an amazing crash course in discipleship. As Jesus presumably talked about all sorts of things. And I imagine re-emphasized and clarified much of what he taught them in the three years of his earthly ministry. That teaching, of course, then formed the foundation of their preaching and the letters of the New Testament. In which case, isn't it surprising and striking that Luke sums up all of that teaching by that single phrase, the kingdom of God. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Why use that phrase to sum up the content of all of that teaching, 40 days, and really the whole of the New Testament? Why not say he spoke to them about the love of God? Or he spoke to them about heaven? Or he spoke to them, as he did in the Sermon on the Mount, about the righteous life? Well, the reason, of course, is because the kingdom of God has been God's great concern from the beginning of the Bible. And it's Jesus' great concern throughout the Gospels. And that is because really the kingdom of God is the, the greatest thing it is possible to talk about in relation to God's purposes on earth. The kingdom of God is a way of talking about God ruling over his world. It's a way of describing a situation in which God's king rules perfectly, uncontested, unchallenged by evil forever over all things. And this reminds us of the enormity of what Jesus has been about. Remember the Lord's Prayer, the most prayed prayer of all time. What does it pray for? It prays, doesn't it, for the kingdom to come, for God's perfect reign to be recognized by all and contested by nobody. But why speak of the kingdom here? At this point, when he's about to leave them, 
Well, as the passage goes on to reveal, it is because of the unique time that the disciples find themselves in. A time when the kingdom has come and has not come. And it's this time that we need to understand to understand our mission. So the kingdom has come through Jesus' death and resurrection. In his death on the cross, he has brought about the forgiveness of sins. He has gone through the curtain, become the curtain, as we saw this morning. In his resurrection from the dead, he has conquered God's great enemy, the enemy of humanity, the enemy of death. Here, then, is the king of God's kingdom. The disciples are looking at the kingdom of God the rightful, ruling, reigning, risen Lord of heaven and earth, the kingdom has come. And this is why the disciples are not wrong in verse 6 to ask about the kingdom of Israel. They are often criticized here for asking the wrong questions, but I think it's exactly the right question to ask. They've rightly understood that Jesus has fulfilled all the expectations of the Old Testament that he's taken upon himself the authority of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He's about to ascend as the son of man of Daniel 7 to take his seat at the right hand of God. He is going to be given all rule and authority and power. The kingdom of God has come. But what they do not yet understand, and what they must understand, is the kingdom has not yet come. And so Jesus adjusts their thinking He complicates the issue for them in terms of both space and time. Space, because look at verse 8. They are to take the kingdom now beyond the borders of Israel. That's where their understanding was too small. He wasn't just king of Israel, he was king of the world. And so they are now to take the kingdom to the ends of the earth and time. Because as we'll see, he's going to leave them time to do it. But this is why he now speaks of the spirit. Because thirdly, Jesus' mission is to establish his worldwide kingdom through his spirit-filled witnesses. You can't miss the connection between the spirit and the kingdom of God in these verses. He's talking about the kingdom, verse 3. Then he turns to the spirit, verses 4 and 5. Then back to the kingdom, verse 6. And then back to the spirit, Verse 7 and 8, kingdom, spirit, kingdom, spirit, all the way through the passage. And that is because in Jesus' mind and in the Old Testament, there is this inevitable connection between the kingdom and the spirit. For the Old Testament promised that the spirit of God would bring about the kingdom of God in the last days. Think of the prophet Joel, who Peter uh, speaks of in Acts 2, bringing about that day of the Lord and relationship with God, establishing the rule and presence of God in the hearts and minds of his people at last. It is through the spirit of God that the end will come and God will bring his people in, gather his flock from all nations. But how exactly will that happen? You may, if you read the Old Testament, have imagined a kind of a tsunami effect or a baptism of fire some kind of direct apocalyptic intervention from God. That may be what the disciples had in their minds. And so look with me at verse 8 and see if you can sense perhaps both the thrill and the horror of what Jesus now tells the disciples. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth? The simple answer is that the Spirit is not going to bring the kingdom by this great apocalyptic intervention. But the kingdom's going to come through them, through their witness. The Spirit is going to empower them for the mission that Jesus is leaving them with. Now, how does verse 8 make you feel, I wonder? This verse, I think, often when I've heard it preached, is turned into an imperative. It's often used by preachers as a kind of a rallying cry to get Christians to do evangelism. You must be witnesses. 
And that's true. We are all to be involved in evangelism. But I think that's to miss the point of the sentence. He says, you will be witnesses. It's not actually an imperative. It's not a command. It's a statement of fact. When you witness something, say a car crash or a crime, you are called before the court to witness to what you saw or you're questioned by the policeman by the side of the road. You simply are a witness by virtue of what you see. And Jesus is saying, you have seen the king, the Lord of heaven and earth. You are now witnesses. So why do they need the spirit? Why do they need that power? Why couldn't they just go off and do it on their own bat in their own strength and intelligence? Well, to see this, you need to read through the book of Acts again. And you'll see that again and again and again, the disciples witness, not in the face of neutrality or welcome, but in the face of fear and rejection. Because just as in any court of law, where there are witnesses, there are always those who oppose or deny the witness. Evangelism is always in the face of opposition. That is why we find it so hard. The non-Christian person does not want to be evangelized. The Christian person does not want to evangelize. It's two things. One thing that both Christian and non-Christian agree completely on. None of us like evangelism. And we were reminded of this recently when we rewatched the film, quite old now, called Witness. Some of you may remember it. I think it's from the 1980s, starring Harrison Ford. It's about an Amish boy who witnesses a crime. But the story is not straightforward because the criminals do not want him to speak. And so the whole film is about Harrison Ford protecting the boy from the criminal. And it's the same in the book of Acts. It's the same in church history. It's the same today. The witness to the gospel is never without opposition. It's never uncontested. Evangelism is never pain free. And that's why we need the spirit. And in the book of Acts, you'll see that when the spirit comes, he overcomes fear and self-preservation. It's the power of the spirit, not to make the mission easy, but to make the mission possible. So his witnesses do speak in the face of opposition. So here is the mission of Jesus. To extend his rule, the rule of God, to the far corners of the earth. The mission of Jesus is the mission of the gospel. It's the mission that confronts eternity. It's a mission that brings people salvation. It's a mission, as we'll see in chapter 10, in the passage we're going to look at later in the term, uh, in a guest service, that brings people face to face with Jesus as the judge and then invites them to trust in him as savior. In other words, this is the mission that our world needs. Because this is the great crisis of our world, a relationship with God that is broken. The great issue in our world is not disease or poverty or peace or physical health or political freedom or climate change. But it's where every man, woman, boy and girl will spend eternity. Whether they will bow the knee to Jesus and call him saviour and lord. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, and if we're a church of Jesus, then we are, whether we choose it or not, caught up in this witnessing mission through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me conclude with three implications. Firstly, enemies. We said that the mission is possible, but it's not mission easy. In fact, if there is one thing we're going to see again and again in the book of Acts, it's that the kingdom progresses in the face of opposition and hostility. And that hostility is fundamentally against Jesus Christ. It's a satanic hostility because his claim to lordship that the powers of this world are defeated is something that Satan hates. It is Jesus himself the judge of the living and the dead, the one who came to save the lost, who 
was oppressed by humanity and now stands over and against us as judge. It is he who is so offensive to the people of this world. But of course, that hostility is aimed against us, his witnesses. And so the book of Acts and the history of the church and our experience as Christians is full of suffering and persecution. And we're going to see that their context is very much like ours. As we saw this morning, they did not have a strong voice in the public square. Neither do we. They were not seen as harmless, but as dangerous. So are we. Their culture despised them and regarded what they stood for with suspicion. So does ours. They were viewed by the authorities as a barrier to a happy society. So are we increasingly. The gospel is a rival to every power. And so Satan will always work to silence the gospel. And this is the reason the Holy Spirit has been given. To give us power to witness in the face of hostility. Second implication is numbers. You may know that Luke has structured his book very carefully around six or seven markers which tell us of the progress of the world. They're little viewpoints where he pauses the action and says, look, this is what's going on. There's all sorts of bad things happening. Christians are being imprisoned, beaten, flogged, even killed. The gospel is opposed with the same satanic hostility that put Jesus on the cross. The preaching of the gospel is hard work, but he says, look back and see. What is happening is what Jesus said would happen. He said the message would go out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what you see happening. And this is what must happen because Jesus is Lord of all the earth. But what I want us to notice this evening is another detail. And that is how preoccupied Luke is with numbers. You sometimes hear Christians belittling a concern with numbers. As if numbers of people in church is a little bit unspiritual, a little bit impractical, uh, too pragmatic, too businesslike. But let me show you Luke's interest in numbers very quickly on the screen. Acts 2.41. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 2.47. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 6, 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Acts 9, 31, then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. And Acts 16, 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Why do numbers matter? Because people matter. God is growing his church, not as an institution, not as a building, but as people. Jesus is growing his kingdom, not geographically, but humanly. And that kingdom growth is not an abstract idea, but it's a matter of flesh and blood people. People built for eternity, who hear the word, are built into the church, and will be with Jesus around the throne uh, for all time. And this is why. We want to grow this building to serve that mission of numbers, the mission of Jesus. So let me remind you of the Building for Growth purpose statement. To expand our long-term capacity for growth through developing our buildings so that people in ever-increasing numbers can be captured by the gospel, gathered by God's word and equipped for a lifetime of mission through teaching, training, and evangelism. I hope you can see that that purpose statement, which we've been using for quite a while, fits perfectly well with the mission that we've seen and will see in the book of Acts. This is why we want to do it. This is why we're spending our time on it and our money and our energy, because of the numbers, because of the numbers of people who don't know Jesus in this city, because of the numbers of people that God has chosen to be with him in eternity. But there's one more catch, one more complication. Have a look at verse 8 again. And I remember I said that Jesus gives them two things in verse 8. He gives them power and he gives them time. Time to accomplish the mission. 
But now look with me at verse 11. The men are looking into the sky and the angels tell them that he's going to come back in the same way we have seen him go into heaven. And there in a nutshell, the angel maps out for us the rest of human history. It is at this moment that the clock is ticking. The world has moved from BC to AD. Jesus has gone and he will return. That is the next step on the divine calendar. And in the meantime, He's doing one thing and one thing only in his world. He is working by his spirit through his witnesses to grow his kingdom. But the time is short. And so we need to get on with the mission.